Greetings. Welcome to Journey to the Bible. My name is Father Paul Joseph, and we are continuing to the book of Genesis. This is our sixth session on Genesis, and we are beginning begin with chapter 34. So again, this is a book of Genesis, beginning with chapter 20, 34, and this is session number six of Genesis. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, once again, we come before you. It's our prayers of thanksgiving for this opportunity to study the sacred scripture and apply them to our lives. We ask that you continue to bless us and guide us. We also say a special prayer for Tim Desmond, one of our longtime parishioners who was taken to Harbor UCLA Hospital yesterday. We believe he had a heart attack. His wife, Liz, tried to wake him up to come to mass on Monday morning. He was non-responsive. She called the paramedics and I anointed him at Harbor UCLA yesterday. So we continue to pray for Tim Desmond and his wife, Liz, and pray for all those who are suffering and struggling and special prayer for the repose of the soul of Madeline Hasborn, a longtime member of our parish community who passed away on Saturday. And loving God, I call upon your blessings on all of us here today, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we're going to continue with our the twins, Jacob and Esau. Remember, Jacob was the one who took his brother's blessing. Esau was the older twin by a few minutes, but Jacob tricked his father, took his blessing, and then in chapter 33, the two of them reconnected. Jacob, whose name has since been changed to Israel, was obviously very hesitant. I can't believe this. I'm going to meet my brother who I cheated out of his blessing. But yet, in chapter 33, verse 4, Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, and flinging himself on his neck, kissed him as he went. Once again, we continue to recognize the love of two brothers, despite what one has done to the other. It is the message of our Bible, the sense of love, of healing, reconciliation, compassion, and forgiveness. And that was in chapter 33, verse 4. Now we come to the end of chapter 33, verse 18. Having thus come from Padaram, Jacob arrived safely in the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. As I've said a number of times, Canaan is what Israel was referred to as a promised land. Before it became Israel, it was the land of Canaan, home of the Canaanites. He encamped in sight of the city. The plot of ground in which he had pitched his tent, he bought for a hundred pieces of bullion from the descendants of Hamor, the founder of Shechem. He set up a memorial stone there and invoked El, the God of Israel. El, Elohim, one of the different names for the God of Israel. We hear Yahweh, we hear uh, other names as well, but we do recognize it is the one true God. It is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the one who sent his son into our world. Now, remember, Jacob had two wives. Leah, who he married first, but Rachel was the one who was the more beautiful, the one he was most in love with. But he's married to both of them, which is a common at that time. Now, they had children, but there was one, primarily sons, but there was a daughter, Dinah. And this is chapter 34, verse 1. This is one of the most challenging parts of the Old Testament, the entire Bible. And it has to do with the rape of Dinah. And this is chapter 34, verse 1. Dinah, the daughter whom Leah had borne to Jacob, went out to visit some of the women of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite, who was chief of the region, saw her, he seized her and lay with her by force. He basically raped her. Since he was strongly attracted to Dinah, daughter of Jacob, indeed was really in love with the girl, he endeavored to win her affection. That passage does not make any sense at all. He has seized her, laid with her by force, but he was really in love with her and endeavored to win her affection. Really, that's how he's going to win her affection, by raping her? Well, obviously, that didn't work. Shechem also asked his father, Hamor, get me this girl for a wife. Basically, give me what I want. I am deserving of everything. I should have anything I want. Now, as we know, a lot of the marriages of that time were arranged by the parents. This was not uncommon. But we do know that it was out of the selfishness of Shechem that he raped her and then asked to have her as his wife. In verse 5, Meanwhile, Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dinah. 
Let's hang on one second. There we go. But since he was, his sons were out in the fields with his livestock, he held his peace until they came home. What is he going to do? The sons are out there. There's nothing he can do. Verse 6. Now, Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to discuss the matter with Jacob, just as Jacob's sons were coming in from the fields. When they heard the news, the men were shocked and seethed with indignation. What Shechem had done was an outrage in Israel. Such a thing could not be tolerated. It's interesting. Hamar, the father of Shechem, goes out to discuss the matter with Jacob as if they're discussing their flocks or their crops. Obviously, this is huge. What Shechem had done was an outrage in Israel. Such a thing could not be tolerated. In verse 8, Hamor appealed to them, saying, My son Shechem has his heart set on your daughter. Please give her to him in your marriage. Really? His heart set on her? Somebody's just raped? Verse 9, intermarry with us, give your daughters to us, and take our daughters for yourselves. Thus you can live among us. The land is open before you. You can settle and move about freely in it and acquire landed property here. Then Shechem too appealed to Dinah's father and brothers. Do me this favor, and I will pay you whatever you demand of me. No matter how high you set the bridal price, I will pay you whatever you ask. Only give me the maiden in marriage. The bridal price is like a dowry that was very common at that time. Here Shechem is bargaining for this woman Dinah, like he's bargaining for a cow or a pig or a chicken. But in reality, if we're talking about a human being here, and he has done something that cannot be tolerated. In verse 13, Jacob's sons replied to Shechem and his father Hamar with guile, speaking as they did because their sister Dinah had been defiled. We could not do such a thing, they said, as to give our sister to an uncircumcised man. That would be a disgrace for us. We will agree with you only on this condition that you become like us by having every male among you circumcised. That's an interesting plan, but you can see what direction they're going here. Verse 16, then we will give you our daughters and take yours in marriage. We will settle among you and become one kindred people with you. But if you do not comply with our terms regarding circumcision, we'll take our daughter and go away. They're basically playing hardball with them. Verse 18, their proposal seemed fair to Hamor and his son Shechem. They're basically willing to do anything to get Dinah. Verse 19, the young man lost no time in acting in the matter since he was deeply in love with Jacob's daughter. And again, deeply in love after he's raped her. Moreover, he was more highly respected than anyone else in his clan. So Hamar and his son Shechem went to their town council and thus presented the matter to their fellow townsmen. These men are friendly towards us. Let them settle in the land and move about in it freely. There is ample room in the country for them. We can marry their daughters and give our daughters to them in marriage. But the men will agree to live with us and form one kindred people with us only on one condition, that every male among us be circumcised as they themselves are. Would not the livestock have been acquired? All their animals then be ours? Let us therefore give in to them so that they may settle among us. Notice what they're looking for here. All the livestock, all the daughters, they are greedy, evil people. Verse 24, all the able-bodied men of the town agreed with Hamar and his son Shechem, and all the males, including every able-bodied man in the community, were circumcised. On the third day, while they were still in pain, Dinah's full brothers, Simeon and Levi, two of Jacob's sons, took their swords and advanced against the city without any trouble and massacred all the males. It's interesting here. Now they're going in a sense of tricking them so that they can take revenge. And that's exactly what they did. These men are suffering. There's nothing that they can do. So Dinah's full brothers, Simeon and Levi, two of Jacob's sons, took their swords, advanced against the city without any trouble and massacred all the males. And verse 26, after they had put Hamar and his son Shechem to the sword, they took Dinah from Shechem's house and left. Then the other sons of Jacob followed up the slaughter and sacked the city in reprisal for their sister Dinah's defilement. They seized their flocks, herds, and asses, whatever was in the city and in the country. They carried off all their wealth, 
their women and their children, and took for loot whatever was in the house. You can imagine how angry they were. You can imagine how furious they were. But what they did here was a very evil trick with a sense of revenge. As God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Verse 30, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble upon me by making me loathsome to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. I have so few men that if these people unite against me and attack me, I and my family will be wiped out. But they retorted, should our sister have been treated like a harlot? So now Jacob's a little concerned about this. He realizes what his sons have done. He realizes that they've killed all these men. What happens if the others, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, then decide to form armies against Jacob and his family? That's the risk that the brothers have put, that his sons, the brothers of Dinah, have put before him. In chapter 35, God said to Jacob, go up now to Bethel, settle there and build an altar there to the God who appeared to you while you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob told his family and all the others who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods that you have among you. Then purify yourselves and go put on fresh clothes. This is the first commandment. I am the Lord, your God. You shall have no false gods before me. What is Jacob saying to his family? Get rid of the foreign gods that you have among you. Then purify yourselves and put on fresh clothes. Verse three, we are now to go up to Bethel and I will build an altar there to the God who answered me in my hour of distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. They therefore handed over to Jacob all the foreign gods in their possession and also the rings that they had in their ears. Then as they set out, a terror from God fell upon the towns around about so that no one pursued the sons of Jacob. Jacob has been chosen by God. Jacob has a plan or God has a plan which Jacob to fulfill. As a result, God is taking care of him. In verse six, thus Jacob and all the people that were with him arrived in Luz, that is Bethel, and the land of Canaan. There he built an altar and named the place Bethel, for it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Remember, he had stolen Esau's blessing. He was fleeing from his brother, and God protected him. Verse 8, death came to Rebekah's nurse, Deborah. She was buried under the oak below Bethel, and so it was called Alam Bakuth. On Jacob's arrival from Tanandanam, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, you whose name is Jacob shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he was named Israel. Now notice we already had that happen in a couple chapters ago, back at the end of chapter 32, but now God is affirming his name is no longer Jacob. His God will be Israel, his name will be Israel. Verse 11, God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, indeed an assembly of nations, shall stem from you, and kings shall issue from your loins. The land I once gave to Abraham and Isaac, I now give to you, and to your descendants after you will I give this land. Once again, it's the covenant, the promise of God to the Hebrew people, and then there we eventually become Israelites, then they become Jews, Somebody said, remember the alphabetical, H-I-J. First, they were Hebrews, H, then they were Israelites, I, and then they were Jews, J. Verse 13, then God departed from him. On the site where God had spoken with him, Jacob set up a memorial stone, and upon it he made a libation and poured out oil. Jacob named the site Bethel because God had spoken with him there. What we'll notice a lot of times in his readings, the scenes seem to be repetitive. We just heard a few minutes ago that it was to be called Bethel because God has spoken with him there. We're not sure why. We do know that there were probably four writers in the book of Genesis. Some of them may have been repeating, maybe weren't aware of what somebody else had said. It's really hard to put this together because it was thousands of years ago. But we do know that the Bible was assembled under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to guide us in our journey of faith. Verse 16. Then they departed from Bethel, 
while they had still gone some had some distance to go on the way to Ephrath, Rachel began to be in labor and to suffer great distress. When her pangs were most severe, her midwife said to her, have no fear. This time too, you have a son. With her last breath, for she was at the point of death, she called him ben Oai. His father, however, named him Benjamin. Thus Rachel died, and she was buried on the road to Ephra, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a memorial stone on her grave, and the same monument marks Rachel's grave to this day. Benjamin is the last of the 12 sons, the 12 sons of uh, Jacob, and this is one we'll get to later on, was one of the ones where he favored because he was the youngest. And as we'll see, that gets into a bit of a confusing situation with the other brothers. So in verse 21, Israel moved on and pitched his tent beyond Megaladair. While Israel was encamped in that region, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. When Israel heard of it, he was greatly offended. Sometimes the morals of the people of the Old Testament seem to be matching the morals of people today. Here is Reuben, son of Jacob, went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. Remember, a concubine was like a second-class wife. It's something that we don't understand in our world today, but very common at that time. So for a son to lay with his father's concubine was a great offense. Now, in verse 23, we have now the sons of Jacob were now 12. Okay, Leah had Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Isaac, Sar, and Zebulun. Now, Rachel had the two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Rachel's maid, Bilhah, were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Leah's maid, Zilpah, were Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him and Padaram. Now, remember, he also had the daughter Dinah, but that's not really considered in the sense of what they're putting together here, because this is the essence of the 12 tribes of Israel. In the outline that I provided on page 11, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. That shows up in uh, chapter 49, but we'll get into that in a bit. But it's the 12 sons of Jacob, who is now known as Israel, become the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 27. Jacob went home to his father Isaac at Mamre and Kirathabah, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. The lifetime was, of Isaac was 180 years. Then he breathed his last. After a full life, he died as an old man and was taken to his kinsmen. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. The twin sons of Isaac are the ones who buried their father. Now, this is a question that comes up quite often. It says quite clearly in the early part of Genesis that our lives will only be 120 years. And now here we have Isaac who lived 180 years. How is that possible? It's very confusing because of the translations. What was really written for the idea of 120 years? Did Isaac really live 180 years or is there some years that are missing a gap? We're not really sure. And it's one of those things you can spend hours discussing, but the reality is God has made us so that our lives are limited to basically 120 years. No, very few make it that far, but that's basically the limit according to the book of Genesis. Now in chapter 36, we're gonna get into a lot of genealogy, a lot of names of people. Chapter 36, verse one. These are the descendants of Esau, that is Edom. Esau took his wives, from among the Canaanite women, and this was not what God wanted, but that's what he did. It's obviously upset his father. But what we look at is the idea that this is what he did. And then throughout the rest of this chapter, we see all of the genealogy. Verse six, Esau took his wives, his sons, daughters, and all of them, and he continued on to the land of Seir, then he has, in verse 10, all the names of Esau's sons. In verse 15, the following are the clans of Esau's descendants. Verse 20, the following are the descendants of Seir the Horite and the original settlers in the land. Chapter 31, no, excuse me, verse 31. 
The following are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. And it gives all the list of the kings here. Verse 40, the following are the names of the clans of Esau individually according to their subdivisions and localities. And it goes into all this. The last line, the last verse of chapter 36 points out that Esau was the father of the Edomites. And we'll get into the Edomites later on, but that's important to notice there because he was the father of the Edomites. Now, remember, Jacob, now known as Israel, had 12 sons and the daughter Dinah. I hate to put Dinah to the side, but she's not going to be as relevant as the other brothers. And what happens is the two youngest brothers were Joseph and then finally the youngest brother, Benjamin. And what's going to happen here is going to be some very confusing situations, but work with me and follow with me, if you will. Chapter 37. Jacob settled, chapter 37, verse 1. Jacob settled in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is his family history. When Joseph was 17 years old, he was tending the flocks with his brothers. He was an assistant to the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah, and he brought his father bad reports about them. These are the concubines. These are the second-class wives, and a 17-year-old Joseph is saying something's rotten in the state of Denmark here. Now, in verse 3, Israel, who used to be known as Jacob, loved Joseph best of all his sons, for he was a child of his old age, and he had made him a long tunic. When his brothers saw that their father loved him best of all his sons, they hated him so much more that they would not even greet him. The idea of jealousy. Now, of course, a father should love all his children the same, but Israel didn't. He had a preference, a real preference for Joseph. So in verse 5, once Joseph had a dream, which he told to his brothers, listen to this dream I had. There were binding sheaves in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose to an upright position, and your sheaves formed a ring around my sheaf and bowed down to it. Are you really going to make yourself king over us, his brothers asked him, or impose your rule on us? So they hated him all the more because of the talk about his dreams. Joseph had very vivid dreams, and also, as we'll find out later, he was someone who could interpret dreams. Verse 9, and then he had another dream, and this one too he told to his brothers. I had another dream, he said. This time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he also told it to his father, his father reproved him. What is the meaning of this dream of yours, he asked. Can it be that I and your mother and your brothers are to come and bow to the ground before you? So his brothers were wrought up against him but his father pondered the matter. His father's thinking about this. Wow, is this really possible? As we see later on in Genesis, there's a very interesting similarity on this. So in verse 12, one day when his brothers had gone to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem, Israel said to Joseph, your brothers, you know, are tending our flocks at Shechem. Get ready, I will send you to them. I'm ready, Joseph answered. Go then, he replied, see if all is well with your brothers and the flocks and bring back word. So he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph reached Shechem, a man met him as he was wandering about in the fields. What are you looking for? The man asked him. I'm looking for my brothers, he answered. Could you please tell me where they're attending the flocks? The man told him. They have moved on from here. In fact, I heard them say, let us go on to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and caught up with them in Dothan. They noticed him from a distance, and before he came up to them, they plotted to kill him. Once again, jealousy, anger, and rage. Verse 19, then they said to one another, here comes that master dreamer. Come, let us kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns here. We could say that a wild beast devoured him. We shall then see what comes of his dreams. Very interesting thought, very conniving, very manipulative. We shall see what then comes of his dreams. In verse 21, Reuben, who is the most sensible of the brothers, 
Verse 21, when Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from their hands saying, we must not take his life. Instead of shedding, shedding blood, he continued, let's just throw him in that cistern there in the desert, but don't kill him outright. His purpose was to rescue him from their hands and restore him to their, his father. Reuben was the good one out of this group. He was the one who said, yeah, we'll throw him in the cistern. We could just leave him there. But of course, his plan was to come back and save him. Verse 23. So when Joseph came up to them, they stripped him of the long tunic he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the cistern, which was empty and dry. Then they sat down to their meal. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels, camels laden with gum, balm, and resin to be taken down to Egypt. Remember, the Ishmaelites were the descendants of Ishmael, the other son of Abraham, who was born before Isaac. He was the son of Hagar, the slave woman. They are the Ishmaelites. So they're on their way to Egypt. And in verse 26, Judah says to his brothers, what is to be gained by killing our brother and concealing his blood? Rather, let us sell him to these Ishmaelites instead of doing away with him ourselves. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. Isn't it interesting? Now, instead of killing him, they're going to settle for cold, hard cash. They are going to sell him, turn him over, betray him, and take the money and run. In verse 28, they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Some Midianite traders passed by, and they pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and took him to Egypt. When Reuben went back to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not in it, he tore his clothes, and returning to his brothers, he exclaimed, the boy is gone, and I, where can I turn? They took Joseph's tunic, and after slaughtering a goat, dipped the tunic in its blood. They then sent someone to bring the long tunic to their father with the message, we found this. See whether it is your son's tunic or not. He recognized it and exclaimed, my son's tunic, a wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. Then Jacob rent his clothes, put sackcloth on his loins, and mourned his son many days. Though his sons and daughters tried to console him, he refused all consolation, saying, no, I will go down mourning to my son in the netherworld. Thus did his father lament him. Now, how do you think the brothers felt then? They have sold their brother into slavery. They realize how their father is suffering. They tried to trick him by putting the goat's blood on Joseph's tunic. And so what happens? His father is so distraught, so hurt, so unconsolable. Thus did his father lament him. In verse 36, the Midianites, meanwhile, sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, a courtier of Pharaoh and his chief steward. This is critical here. Joseph does not remain just a simple slave. He is told, sold to someone who works for the Pharaoh, who is the head of the Egyptians and his chief steward. So things are going to change in the life of Joseph. Chapter 38, verse 1. About that time, Judah parted from his brothers and pitched his tent near a certain Adomalonat named Hira. Remember, there were 12 brothers, Judah, Reuben, Joseph, the youngest one, Benjamin, we'll get to in a few minutes. Verse 2. There, this is talking about Judah. There he met the daughter of a Canaanite named Shua, married her and had relations with her. Again, this is exactly what Israel did not want. He did not want his sons to marry Canaanite women. He wanted them to marry Hebrew women. Verse 3, she conceived and bore a son who she named Ur. Again, she conceived and bore a son who she named Onan. Then she bore still another son whom she named Shelah. They were in Chesed when he was born. Judah got a wife named Tamar for his firstborn Ur, but Ur, Judah's firstborn, greatly offended the Lord. So the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, unite with your brother's widow in fulfillment of your duty as a brother-in-law 
and thus preserve your brother's line. The idea, if a brother died without any children, he would be forgotten, he would have no descendants. So one of his other brothers would marry the widow, have children in his brother's name, and then his name would continue. Verse nine, Onan, however, knew that the descendants would not be counted as his. They'd be his brothers, obviously. So whenever he had relations with his brother's widow, he wasted his seed on the ground to avoid contributing offspring for his brother. What he did greatly offended the Lord, and the Lord took his life too, because the idea of the Leverite marriage, the idea of following the marriage uh, of the uh, widow to be able to have uh, children for your brother was exactly the plan of the people at that time, and Onan did not follow it. Verse 11, thereupon Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, stay as a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he feared that Shelah also might die like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. Years passed and Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua died. After Judah completed the period of mourning, he went up to Timnah for the sharing, sharing, of, his, sharing of his sheep in company with his friend Hirah the Adolamite. I know we've got a lot of names here. I'm trying to think, well, wait a second. Daughter of Shua, friend Hirah, the Adulamite. We're probably thinking, what is this of significance? I don't know these people. They're not famous. I don't know these towns. They're not famous. But it's all part of the inspired word of God. And people say, why don't they just clear it out? Well, you can buy Bibles that are abridged versions. And it says right on the cover, this does not include the entire scripture. When we got in the seminary, a couple of seminarians had Bibles like that. And the priest said, no, we have to have the full text because it's a full text that's inspired by the Holy Spirit. But if you pick up a children's Bible or a student's Bible, it may not include everything that we have here. What we'll have are stories that touch their hearts and guide them closer to God, and that's wonderful. But in the seminary, in our journey through the Bible, we'll continue with the full text. Verse 13, when Tamar was told that her father-in-law was on his way up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garb, veiled her face by covering herself with a shawl, and sat down at the entrance to Enam, which is on the way to Timnah. For she was aware that although Shelah, not grown up, she had not been given to him, in, now grown up, she had not been given to him in marriage. That was the promise. When Shelah grows up, that will become her husband. But this hasn't happened. Verse 15. When Judah saw her, he mistook her for a harlot, since she had covered her face. So he went over to her at the roadside, and not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, said, come, let me have intercourse with you. She replied, what will you pay me for letting me have intercourse with you? He answered, I will send you a kid from the flock. Very well, she said, provided that you leave a pledge until you send it. She is manipulating him. She is conning him. Now, I don't see how Judah could mistake her for a harlot when that's his daughter-in-law. But again, she was well covered. She was well hidden. And here he is, finds her on the side of the road and says, come, let me have intercourse with you. And she says, well, what do I get out of this? Well, I'll give you a kid from the flock. Very well, she said, provided you leave a pledge until you send it. Kind of like collateral, if you will. Judah asked, what pledge am I to give you? She answered, your seal and a cord. The seal was what you would stamp in the wax to make the seal of the person. You know, like when you seal a letter, or sometimes you've seen things or a seal with the wax. And then the cord would be what would be connected to the seal. So she answered, your seal and a cord and the staff you carry. Well, that's a lot for a kid go. But anyway, that's what the ever. So he gave them to her, had intercourse with her, and she conceived by him. When she went away, she took off her shawl and put on her widow's garb again. So she is very manipulative here. She knows exactly what she's doing. At verse 20, Judas sent the kid, the goat, by his friend, the Adelite, to recover the pledge from the woman, but he couldn't find her. So he asked the man of the place, where is the temple prostitute, the one by the roadside at Naam? But they answered, there's never been a temple prostitute here. He went back to Judah and told him, I could not find her. And besides, the men of the place 
and there said there was no temple prostitute there. So in verse 23, let her keep the things Judah replied, otherwise we should become a laughing stock. After all, I did send her the kid, even though you were unable to find her. So Judah's like saying, well, I messed up here, but let bygones be bygones. Let's get on with my life here and everything will be fine. Until we get to verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told that his daughter-in-law, Tamar, had played the harlot and was then with child from her harlotry. Bring her out, Judah cried. She shall be burned. But as they were bringing her out, she sent word to her father-in-law. It is by the man to whom these things belong that I am with child. Please verify, she added, whose seal and cord and whose staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more in the right than I am, since that I did not give her to my son, Shayla, but he had no further relations with her. Notice how conniving and manipulative some of the people are in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. Not something that we wanna use as an example, but as part of our salvation history, we recognize what people did out of their own selfish desires rather than the will of God. So he did not give her the son Shayla that he promised. He had no further relations with her and seems like everything would be going fine. Judah has learned his lesson. In verse 27, when the time of her delivery came, she was found to have twins in her womb. While she was giving birth, one infant put out his hand, and the midwife, taking a crimson thread, tied it on his hand to note that this one came out first. Remember, the one that comes out first is obviously the oldest. That is the one who gets the blessing. That's the one who gets the majority of the inheritance. So what she did is she ties a, a, a crimson thread around his hand so no matter what happens, everybody will know that he is the firstborn. Wait, chapter 29, or excuse me, verse 29. But as he withdrew his hand, his brother came out and she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. So he was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out. He was called Zerah. These are not exactly well-known names, but it's very interesting to see how all these family dynamics take place, what's happening in their world. Now in verse 39, excuse me, chapter 39, verse one, when Joseph was taken down to Egypt, a certain Egyptian, Potiphar, a courtier of Pharaoh and the chief steward, brought, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there. Remember, his brothers had sold him to the Ishmaelites. Now the Egyptian chief steward is going to buy Joseph. Joseph is the one that was loved most by his father. He was the one who interpreted the dreams. He is the one who was then sold into slavery. Verse two, but since the Lord was with him, Joseph got on very well, was assigned to the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, he brought him success in whatever he did. He took a liking to Joseph and made him his personal attendant. He put him in charge of all of his household and entrusted to him all his possessions. Joseph now has a very good life ahead of him. Verse 5. From the moment that he had put him in charge of his household and all his possessions, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. In fact, the Lord's blessing was on everything he owned, both inside the house and out. Having left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, he gave no thought with Joseph there to anything but the food he ate. He was so comfortable. He's got such a prized person here in Joseph. He doesn't have to worry about anything except the food that he eats. <coughs> now, <coughs> excuse me, once more, we're going to get into a very confusing situation. This is the middle of verse six. Now, Joseph was strikingly handsome in countenance and body. After a time, his master's wife began to look fondly at him and said, lie with me but he refused. As long as I'm here, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, but has entrusted me to all he owns. And remember, wives were considered possessions of their husband, so everything is entrusted to Joseph, and he is making sure that he takes care of everything. Verse 9, he wields no more authority in this house than I do, 
and he has withheld from me nothing but yourself, since you are his wife. How then could I commit so great a wrong and thus stand condemned before God? Although she tried to entice him day after day, he would not agree to lie beside her or even stay near her. Verse 11. One such day when Joseph came into the house to do his work, and none of the household servants were then in the house, she laid hold of him by his cloak, saying, lie with me. But leaving the cloak in her hand, he got away from her and ran outside. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand as he fled outside, she screamed for her household servants and told them, look, my husband has brought in a Hebrew slave to make sport of us. He came in here to lie with me, but I cried out as loud as I could. She's not getting her way, so she's going to make a mess for Joseph. Verse 15, when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran away outside. She kept the cloak with her until her ma his master came home. Then she told him the same story. The Hebrew slave whom you brought here broke in on me to make sport of me. When I screamed for help, he left his cloak behind beside me and fled outside. As soon as the master heard his wife's story about how his slave had treated her, he became enraged. Obviously, he's going to trust his wife, and he's furious. Verse 20, he seized Joseph and threw him into the jail where the royal prisoners were confined. But even while he was in prison, the Lord remained with Joseph. He showed him kindness by making, him the, chief, by making the chief jailer well disposed towards him. Joseph has a way with people. Notice what's happening here. The chief jailer is now growing fond of him. The chief jailer put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners in the jail, and everything that had to be done there was done under his management. The chief jailer <clears throat> did not concern himself with anything at all that was in Joseph's charge, since the Lord was with him and brought success to all that he did. So it's very interesting to see how Joseph, sold into slavery, betrayed by his brothers, He's now becoming quite successful. Even though he's in jail, he is proving <clears throat> that he has great success. On chapter 40, check the time here real quick, okay. Chapter 40, verse 1. Sometime afterward, the royal cupbearer and baker gave offense to their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two courtiers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the chief steward, the same jail where Joseph was confined. The chief steward assigned Joseph to them and he became their attendant. Once more, Joseph has more responsibility, even if it's over other prisoners. After they had been in custody for some time, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the jail, both had dreams on the same night, each dream with its own meaning. Remember, let's go back. Joseph had dreams and he could interpret dreams. Now see what's happening in the jail cells. And verse six, when Joseph came to them in the morning, he noticed that they looked disturbed. So he asked Pharaoh's courtiers who were with him in custody in his master's house. Why do you look so sad today? They answered him, we have had dreams, but there is no one to interpret them for us. Joseph said to them, Surely interpretations come from God. Please tell the dreams to me. Now, a lot of people got into the idea of dream analysis, dream interpretations. There are a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists have done a lot of work on this. And there are people who have street corner shops where they are willing to interpret your dreams for a re very reasonable fee. Now, we look at what's happening here is God has given Joseph a gift. He says here, surely interpretations come from God. Please tell the dreams to me. Joseph is not patting himself on the back. He is saying that all of his gifts come from God. Verse 9. Then the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. In my dream, he said, I saw a vine in front of me. And on the vine, there were three branches. It had barely budded when its blossoms came out, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes, pressed them into the cup, and put them in Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said to them, this is what it means. The three branches are three days. 
Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your post. You'll be handing Pharaoh his cup as you formerly used to do when you were his cupbearer. So if you will still remember when all was well with you that I was here with you, please do me the favor of mentioning me to Pharaoh to get me out of this place. Joseph has interpreted his dream, told him he would go back to Pharaoh. Please let the Pharaoh know that I did this. Please help me. I don't want to be in this dungeon anymore. Verse 16. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had this favorable interpretation, he said to him, I too had a dream. In it, I had three wicker baskets on my head. And the top one were all kinds of bakery products for Pharaoh. But the birds were pecking at them out of the basket on my head. Joseph said to him in reply, this is what it means. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and have you impaled on a stake, and the birds will be pecking the flesh from your body. Not exactly what he wanted to hear. Remember, the cupbearer got good news, the chief baker, not so much. Verse 20, and in fact, on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, when he gave a banquet to all his staff with his courtiers around him, he lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office, so he again handed the cup to Pharaoh. He's back in good graces. He's back where he was. Verse 22, but the chief baker, he impaled, just as Joseph had told him in his interpretation. Yet the chief cupbearer gave no thought to Joseph. He'd forgotten all about him. You know, you look at this and you say, really? You do so much for somebody, and then they totally forget about you? Well, that's exactly what happened here. So this is the end of chapter 40. Our hour is just about coming to an end here. But what's going to happen now in the next week, next week when we go through this, Pharaoh is going to have a dream, and he is going to realize that Joseph has powers to interpret his dreams. It's going to be very interesting. Remember, Joseph was put in prison because he was falsely accused of trying to lie with the Pharaoh's wife. What happens here? Pharaoh has a dream, and Joseph is going to interpret it. So next week, we continue with the book of Genesis, chapter 41. Let's take a moment and bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, once again, we come before you as your children, giving thanks for the graces and blessings you bestowed upon us. We ask that you continue to bless us and guide us as we continue our journey through the sacred Bible. And again, we continue to pray for the people of Haiti, people of Afghanistan, people of Louisiana, New Jersey, uh, New York, all the areas that are struggling so. And we continue to pray for our parishioner, Tim Desmond, and his wife, Liz, that the Lord will bless them with comfort, healing, and strength. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Remember, the new Mass schedule starts on Sunday. Saturday remains the same, the Spanish Masses remain the same, but our first Mass on Sunday will be at 6.30, followed by 8 o'clock, then 9.30, 11, and then we'll have our two regular Spanish Masses at 12.30 and 2 o'clock. Thank you and God bless.